Hi, everybody. Well, this is part three. Uh, after the last uh, couple of weeks, we've uh, we've really had uh, very good feedback. Tonight, we're going to have a surgical overview of the options uh, for the treatment of breast cancer that Dr. Donna Marie Manassa is going to present. Dr. Sujan Ahn will present on de-escalating therapy. Dr. Katie Weichman will be speaking on reconstructive options and oncoplastic surgery. And Dr. Oriana Cohn will be talking on updates in lymphedema. In lymphedema. You know, it's uh, interesting because there's going to be a lot of overlap in this particular session, uh, unlike the other two sessions. Uh, in the first session, we, we talked about prevention and screening, genetics, nutrition, and the questions you should ask in preparing for a consultation. And part two, we talked about particular breast cancer, stage zero, triple negative, metastatic breast cancer, and diversity and inclusion, and clinical trials. Now we have uh, tonight our breast surgeons and our plastic surgeons. We're very lucky. What we didn't talk about, uh, we did talk about triple negative breast cancer, but we didn't talk about the other types of breast cancer. And I wanted just to put this in because I didn't know if we were going to cover it. Most breast cancer is estrogen or progesterone receptor positive, two thirds. So that's why people who get treated for breast cancer get offered an anti-estrogen or an anti-hormone pill. It's called a luminal A tumor. Most cancers are luminal A. They're usually uh, more, uh, more, more well-behaved, less aggressive. Luminal B tumors are HER2 positive and estrogen negative. So HR is hormone receptor positive. Uh, these are usually more aggressive uh, and a little bit harder to treat. And the outcomes tend to be a little bit poorer. Now, the triple negative, which a lot of people do hear about, are basal cell uh, or basal-like. These are hormone receptor negative and HER2 negative. So they don't have any markers on their, on their uh, surface of the cell. Um, and these tend to be uh, what, what we call uh, triple negative, more aggressive cancers occur more frequently in Black women, women who are BRCA1 positive. And we talked about the BRCA1 in our first session. And lastly, the uh, HER2 enriched tumors are the, are the estrogen negative and the HER2 positive. And these are also tumors that are more aggressive, but particularly responsive to targeted therapy. Um, so, you know, well into, you know, the 1960s, we were really doing radical mastectomies. And then Bernie Fisher came around and said, we can do something less. Uh, Rose Kushner wrote a book when she had breast cancer and she was treated by my mentor, Peter Pressman. And she also wrote a book called At First You Cry. I don't know if, if anybody has heard of it, only old people like me. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a really great book that made people really think about that you could have options. And then finally, now into you know, the, uh, the early 2000 and 2020, we've got so many more options that are gonna be covered by our surgeons. And then not to take away anything from Dr. On and talking about de-escalating therapy, there's lots of things that we don't have to do now. And rather than start picking out all of these and Dr. Ahn will cover them, what's exciting in our field is that we have options and we have the ability to try to get the same result with less. Um, our first speaker actually just joined us and we are very excited to have her. Donna Marie Manassa is the chief of uh, the Division of Breast Surgery in Brooklyn. She is not new to Brooklyn. She's been in Brooklyn for the last 11 years as the chief of Maimonides. She completed her general surgery residency at New York Presbyterian and her breast surgical oncology fellowship at Memorial. She is a strong advocate of empowering women by educating them about breast health and disease and involved in breastcancer.org. So I am very, very pleased, uh, number one, that that you have joined us and that you uh, are going to be giving your first outreach. So welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Oxerod. I am, I am honored to be part of the team and, and really enjoy this one thing that I love to do as, as being a breast cancer surgeon. So we'll start first with just a general agenda to give an idea about um, surgical options for breast cancer. And the thing to remember 
is that there are actually many options. Um, in the past, we didn't have that many, and now we've evolved to a, a situation where we have many options depending on the, what's going on with the patient and to individualize that therapy. So we'll go through a bit of an introduction, a little bit about what is breast cancer, which I'm sure you've heard uh, in the previous webinars, some history, um, the role of surgery options, and also looking at risk-reducing mastectomy and its role and putting it all together. So breast cancer is a disease that has been around at least since 1600 BC in recorded history. Um, and luckily, its treatment has continued to evolve, especially in the more recent past. The incidence of breast cancer, just to understand our, the problem, in 2023, roughly 297,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer were diagnosed, 55,000 new cases of DCIS, unfortunately 43,000 of which um, women will die from their breast cancer, which is why we still do the things that we do with respect to treatment. Just simply put, what is breast cancer? It's essentially a normal cell um, within the breast duct. This is a duct that um, milk goes through when a baby's being nursed. Um, and this duct has cells that line it. And when one of those cells becomes abnormal, it stops basically essentially being nice to its neighbor, starts overgrowing the space, taking over, and ultimately breaking out of the duct. This is a cancer cell that now has the potential to move beyond the breast, which is what makes breast cancer dangerous. As mentioned by Dr. Oxwell, there's a historical perspective when it comes to surgery. A lot of treatments prior to the 1700s was very, very limited. There really wasn't anything you could do if a woman was, um, had a, a mass in her breast or, or changes in her breast because of a cancer. There really wasn't much to do. In the late 1700s, there started to be a movement towards just removing the cancer of the breast and all the lymph nodes, the little structures under the armpit area that kind of drained the breast. And maybe that that would help. Then in the 19th and 20th century, we developed a little bit more aggressive therapy, you know, what we call a radical mastectomy. This was primarily by Dr. Halstead. And it's the picture that's noted on to the left where you're removing an incredible amount of tissue in that space down, to, including the muscle, down to the rib cage. This unfortunately is actually what made a lot of women fearful of getting treatment and would hide their diagnosis because you just didn't know if you were gonna go into an operating room and still have a breast. And when that breast was removed, how disfiguring it could be. Bernie Fisher in the 70s and 80s, um, then progressed towards, well, do we always have to remove the entire breast? Is that absolutely what's necessary? And a lot of that comes from his thoughts with respect to how breast cancer develops. Is it a local disease or a systemic disease? So he was, among um, others, pioneered the first um, ability to save the breast, what we call breast conservation or lumpectomy. And this, in conjunction with radiation and additional therapies, allowed women to have their cancers removed but still preserve the breast. The reason that this has evolved is because we have a, a better understanding of the disease, that it's more of a local versus systemic disease, that there are also different types of breast cancer. We often use the general term breast cancer, even down to the stages, but there are actually different types of breast cancer that may behave differently. That was what was referenced before by Dr. Oxerod about luminal types and basal types. They may behave differently and requiring different surgical interventions. We've also gotten better in terms of detecting cancers. The technology got better with time. Mammograms got better at finding smaller and smaller cancers. And the smaller the cancer, the less surgery that often is required. And this allows early detection leads to smaller cancers and hence smaller surgery. Interestingly, empowered women added to this by demanding through activism another way, another approach than just removing and disfiguring the breast in all cases. Detection became something that became most, multiple modalities were important. Not only did we use the mammogram, but we also used ultrasound and MRI. Often a woman will say, well, the mammogram doesn't work for me. Well, it kind of depends on what we're looking for. Breast cancers present in very different ways. And sometimes a combination of the three is used to try to determine the type of breast cancer or the size of the breast cancer. We also were able to diagnose breast cancer without necessarily going into an operating room um, by doing what's called a needle biopsy. This allows the surgeon to know when they're going to the operating room the type of surgery that needs to happen and also eliminates the need for the patient to go back and forth to the operating room multiple times. When it comes to treatment, the treatment for breast cancer has also evolved. Primarily a surgical disease, as mentioned in the history, um, has evolved where we also have radiation and medical options. When it comes to surgery, generally we recommend we have two types of surgery, saving the breast or removing the breast, breast conservation versus mastectomy. The decision with respect to a mastectomy often has evolved, as we will hear later, that there are impressive reconstructive options that make mastectomy a much more um, palatable um, situation. Um, with respect to medical, 
therapy developments. There have been multiple regimens in chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapies, and endocrine therapy that allows some of these cancers to be um, to, to decrease in size prior to surgery, allowing someone to save the breast that they desired. And radiation has also allowed us to save the breast in many cases. Now, looking specifically at surgery, as we are talking about surgical options, dental recommendations for mastectomy um, include a total mastectomy. Um, this is where the entire breast is removed. Skin sparing and nipple sparing relate to types of mastectomy where reconstruction will be performed. Skin sparing, basically the nipple and the areola complex are removed. Nipple sparing, only an incision is made, nothing of the skin or the nipple or the areola is removed. With respect to breast conservation surgery, lumpectomy, where you remove the tumor with a margin of tissue around that, um, or in some situations, oncoplastic surgery may be considered where you're doing a lumpectomy but also doing a breast reduction. These are separated from what we do in the armpit area or the axilla. In the axilla, we've moved towards, similarly like in the breast, taking large volumes of lymph nodes, which would cause a lot of disfiguring, to taking small amounts of lymph nodes in most cases. Some of the developing trends with respect to nipple sparing, mastectomies, and reconstruction, as well as choosing which patients really do need that axillary surgery and doing things like sentinel node biopsies, where we take a fewer amount of nodes, have allowed the surgical field with respect to breast cancer to advance in positive ways. So plain and simple, a mastectomy is basically removing the entire breast. The picture to the left depicts exactly where we consider the breast, the nipple real complex in the middle. The picture in the middle shows you total mastectomy with no reconstruction. Basically, it's flat. There's no nipple or areola, and there's a line across the field. The muscle is preserved, so there isn't that same disfigurement that we see uh, in the 60s. And then skin sparing mastectomy, the breast on the right side actually is a reconstructed breast with a nipple that has been reconstructed. So the skin has been spared. The nipple or real complex, which is the center part, has been removed. But there's been an implant in place, which allows the breast to be somewhat symmetric to the other side. Looking back at breast conservation, this is where we preserve the breast tissue. And it's defined as basically lumpectomy with radiation therapy. The two usually go hand in hand because the studies that were done over 30 years ago demonstrated that when they go hand in hand, the survival is equivalent to doing a mastectomy. And basically the indications include that you can remove the primary breast tumor with an adequate margin of normal breast tissue and have an acceptable cosmetic result. You also have to be able to do radiation in most cases, although as time has, uh, as time has progressed, we basically have allowed radiation therapy in some situations not necessarily be required. The picture to the left is what we aim for. That is a, a good uh, cosmetic result. The picture to the right, unfortunately, is breast conservation, but sometimes based on how the breast responds to radiation, the amount of tissue that was removed, we wouldn't necessarily consider that an acceptable cosmetic result and may decide to do something different. This is where oncoplastic plays a huge role. Um, this is where we're removing the breast tumor, but also a large bulk of the breast tissue in the way we would do for a reduction. This is done in conjunction with both the breast and the plastic surgeon. And most times these are women who have an, a, a particular breast size and are candidates for a lumpectomy. There's a lot of creativity that comes into play in choosing where and how to reduce the breast and take out the tumor itself. And the patients that are used for this, they have to be appropriately sized breast for this procedure. So looking at back to mastectomy, um, mastectomy from the 1890s till now has progressed in many different ways in a positive way. A lot of it, again, having to do with our understanding of the disease of breast cancer, as well as more and more um, reconstructive options that have made it possible. Looking at the radical mastectomy, that top left picture was really what that procedure was about. And as you can imagine, when the skin's ultimately closed, you're right on the rib cage. So again, very disfiguring. The modified radical mastectomy came next, and this is where we still took out a large amount of the tissue and the lymph nodes, but we left the muscle intact. And so the chest area is flat, there's no nipple or real complex, and there's a line that goes across the chest. Once reconstruction became much more possible, that's when you had the skin sparing mastectomy, which is where we do we removed a little bit of the skin around the nipple or real complex, but the majority of the skin, her natural breast skin is still in place, and an implant or tissue uh, reconstruction is performed in that area. And then finally, the nipple sparing mastectomy, which is where we are now in, in the appropriate patients, and increasingly um, a number of patients are being able to do this, where we make an, uh, an incision, which you probably can't make out really well, but it's kind of on the outside of that breast uh, that's facing us. And the nipple is her original nipple, um, and we're able to just really remove the breast tissue, preserving the entire skin envelope. 
So this is looking a little bit more at the nipple sparing mastectomy. And again, you're preserving the skin and nipple areola complex. Um, the ducts right under the nipple, um, which we often get concerned about, can be sent as a separate specimen. Um, and as long as there's no disease in those ducts or there's the margin or the edge is, is far enough away, we can preserve the nipple areola complex in that case. Um, local recurrence, looking across studies that have been done over the past decade, are anywhere from 0.6% to 11%. And I have to caution the difference in that because a lot of it has to do with difference in technique and patient selection. Looking at mortality, there's been no difference in mortality overall. There is a, a range of 0.9 to 13% of nipple complications. And again, it also has to do with patient selection, if it's the right patient for this procedure or not. The, the early indications were tumors that at least two centimeters from the nipple, small tumor size, not extensive, although that has, has moved a little bit more, that you can have a little bit more extensive disease. There definitely has to be no skin or nipple involvement because we don't want to leave anything behind. Um, nodes were clinically negative in the initial, but sometimes you will still do that if the node is positive. And from a cosmetic perspective, minimal ptosis of the breast and the breast size has to be appropriate. This was often used in the beginning with patients who were BRCA positive. And this is just another picture of nipple sparing, a better picture of it. The breast that's facing us on, on that left side, literally that incision is where the entire breast tissue was removed um, under the skin envelope and that nipple is her original nipple, producing the, the picture to the right where you really can't tell the difference when you're looking at somebody um, that they've had actually a mastectomy. Looking now at the area of the armpit, so there's two components in breast surgery. There's the uh, axillary um, area, which is the area of the armpit and the breast area. And, and then the, traditionally, when this was first um, put out, the uh, mastectomy was done with the nose and everything was removed in that radical mastectomy. But now we've separated the two and the progress that we see with breast surgery becoming less and less invasive, we see with the axilla. An axillary dissection is essentially where we remove a large number of nodes, greater than 10 nodes. Um, and this is what we call from an area of space called level of one and two. And this removing such a high number of nodes created issues like lymphedema, uh, the, the patient could not have blood draws in that side or would have increased risk of cellulitis. We moved away from that by using the sentinel node dissection uh, in most cases where you're basically removing a smaller number of nodes. And that's what's depicted here is where the breast gets injected with a dye that's in that first panel. Um, and then the node, the dye goes up to the nodes and the nodes that pick up that dye are the nodes that get removed. That's the general concept. Different types of techniques have evolved since the blue dye, um, and we use different techniques all the time, but the idea is to remove fewer number of nodes so you decrease the chance of side effects. When we use a central node dissection is when we usually have clinically node negative nodes. There's no node that has been found to be positive on imaging or exam. Whether the person has had chemotherapy first and has decreased um, the possibility of that node being positive, in other words, a positive node converts to a negative node, if the patient will ultimately get some kind of change in their treatment, depending on what the node shows us, whether chemotherapy is a possibility or decisions that relate to radiation, if having a positive node would make a difference, um, then we would definitely consider doing a central node. The benefits compared to the axillary dissection are basically less morbidity, which is important. So they, we don't see patients as much as we used to before with really enlarged um, arms from the lymphedema that can ensue from the axillary dissection. And it's also, the pathologist can now look at the node more um, thoroughly because they're looking at a fewer number of nodes than looking at a large number. Now, a progress in breast surgery has moved towards risk-reducing mastectomy as well. These are patients who essentially the mastectomy is being performed in the absence of a cancer diagnosis. The most common patient usually is someone with a gene um, positive for breast cancer or the patient who has been diagnosed with breast cancer on one side, the left or right breast, and is asking for a mastectomy on the other side that does not have a cancer. Again, because of the techniques with respect to plastic surgery, which we'll hear about shortly, it has allowed this to be a, a very a much more palatable situation. Um, potential indications in patients with a current or previous diagnosis of breast cancer include you want to reduce the risk, um, it's difficult for the other breast to be surveilled, um, and for symmetry from a reconstructive perspective, one side gets reconstructed, the other side kind of just goes the way biology goes, and the breast after a while can look a little different. Um, and as mentioned, the indications in high-risk patients are if you're VACA positive, um, a strong family history, even without a mutation, and if there's certain histological factors, like you have uh, previous biopsies of atypia or multiple biopsies of atypia, your risk is a bit higher, you want to reduce that as much as possible. 
so in summary, breast cancer treatment is ever evolving, which is, which is nice about um, the way breast cancer treatment has evolved, is that as we learn more about the disease, we alter and respond to that by changing our therapies, in particular with respect to surgery. Um, more screening, more gen genomic diagnostic advances in terms of evaluation of the tumor, as well as development of drug therapy interventions, really allows surgery to be much more individualized and targeted to the patient. Um, and we have progressed which is a good thing, from only one surgical option to many, from the radical mastectomy, which basically removed everything, the muscle, the breast, the skin, and all the lymph nodes, to now a host of surgical options, depending on both the disease process, as well as the patient's preference and the options available to them. Yeah, that actually, interestingly, happens more commonly than, than you'd expect. It's often why pop surgeons try to do the imaging, but sometimes you, you still find some stuff in the, uh, in the pathology that makes you a little concerned. Generally, what we've often done is, is, aside from the mammogram, we may consider an MRI when the area has healed. It depends on the type of pathology. If you're talking about just atypical cells, no cancer, um, then we talk about high-risk reductions with respect to um, drug therapies. Um, and again, evaluation with an MRI when there's been more healing, so there's not as much activity on the MRI. Um, if it's a cancer diagnosis, kind of the same thing with respect to reevaluating the imaging um, when it's safe to ensure that the tissue um, there isn't any other areas that we need to be concerned about. I actually just um, just had a, a, a webinar, a seminar actually, a live seminar about nerve sparing with uh, one of the companies that produces the nerve graft. I think it's an incredible, again, progression of surgical options for women. One of the things about nipple sparing that um, we still struggle a bit with is that not everybody, although the nipple has been spared, has sensation in the nipple. And it, it can be very upsetting to women where the nipple is critical to them in terms of um, their sexual experience, in terms of just feeling that there's something that's just not numb. I've seen some good success with it if it's, if it's the right patient, um, but definitely I think we're gonna be moving a little bit more towards that in conjunction with our plastic surgeons. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a promising and more frequently questioned frontier in the reconstruction. A lot of patients come in and ask about it. You know, the data and the results that we have in the literature are not based on like a randomized study. And actually, we're excited that NYU is participating in a randomized study on nerve uh, re innervation for the nipple to see, you know, in the same patient who has this re innervation on one side versus the other are they quicker to regain any sort of sensation or do they regain any sensation at all? And because so much is unknown, we don't have the data and the numbers, but it's an exciting tool and we have the ability to do it. And so we're offering it more and more. So, I mean, sometimes they can be very small and kind of evasive. It's not something that we are always accustomed to, to look for these small nerves that are coming out of the chest wall laterally. But I do feel that as we do more cases, I have become more cognizant of the presence of these nerves. And I have been, you know, involved in cases where I have, you know, preserved the nerves for the plastic surgeon to use for the nerve graft. So I do agree it's an exciting field. We do still need the long-term data. And I'm really excited that NYU has a clinical trial that'll be kind of looking at the results of this kind of um, technology. Um, I just want to say that it's, really exciting and I'm happy that we're going to be doing the clinical trial and also that it's just important to know that not every patient is a candidate for this as not every patient is a candidate for nipple sparing mastectomy and but it's a, it's just another tool that's going to help improve sort of patient reported outcomes and quality of life which is sort of also important and we're looking at more and more it's not just how it looks it's how it looks how it feels and how the patient sort of is it's more an individualized treatment, patient-centered focus, which is exciting. Going flat just means no reconstruction and and making an, an effort to have it the chest wall be a flat, sort of not concave surface, which sometimes um, with using the tissue that's there, uh, not breast tissue, obviously, but soft tissue that's there to create the most uh, flat and aesthetically pleasing result. Um, and in different scar patterns and with different techniques to make it uh, individualized to the patient. There is a, a, a younger population that may sometimes not want to do reconstruction, but I think it depends on the patient population that you deal with as to whether that, I don't think we can make a generalization, but our plastic surgeons often help in even making sure we have a good cosmetic result in that scenario. 
I think what this really shows as panel is how thoughtful you really have to be and not only just talking to the patient, but talking to each other about what the you know best way to get the best outcome uh, cosmetically mm -hmm. too, not only oncologically. Dr. Sujan Ahn, uh, so we, we've worked together for several years. She completed a breast fellowship at Mount Sinai where she was on faculty for three, year, three years before coming to NYU. Uh, on Long Island. So Dr. Ahn is going to be talking about de-escalating therapy in breast cancer. What does that mean? So today I'll be kind of discussing the evolution of breast surgery and how the treatment for breast surgery has um, changed tremendously over time, as um, Dr. Manasseh also re referred to before. And mostly because I am a surgeon, I'll be mostly focusing on the surgical treatment. So in the 19th century, Dr. William Hustle, who has been mentioned several times before, he documented and developed guidelines for, for radical breast cancer surgery, which was subsequently awarded gold standard status in 1899. And for many decades, so until 1970s, over 90% of patients with breast cancer underwent this radical mastectomy. And Dr. Hustle's theory was that the cancer cells the cancer cells which originated from the breast always pass through the lymph nodes prior to going elsewhere. So what did this surgery entail? Um, and during radical mastectomy, the whole breast, entire axillary lymphatic tissue, pectoralis major and minor muscles were removed. So it was a highly morbid procedure that excites a lot of the soft tissue. And as there were no other options back then, radical mastectomies were performed routinely in a lot of women who are surgical candidates for treatment of breast cancer. But we, um, after this kind of radical surgery, there was very high rate of lymphedema in these patients, which can be a debilitating condition. And there can be a different spectrum of degree of involvement of the lymphedema. And in addition to the lymphedema, patients also have significant chest wall deformity and also a limited range of motion of the upper extremity. Along came Dr. Bernie Fisher, who also was mentioned before, who was the founding member of National Surgical Adjuvant Breast and Bowel Project. And he did challenge Dr. Holster's theory. Uh, Dr. Fisher believed that breast cancer is more like a systemic disease and there is not always a uh, um, uh, progression, progression from breast into the lymph nodes um, and then to systemic um, dissemination. And he also believed that radical mastectomy is not likely to improve survival in the breast cancer patients. One of the most pivotal NSABP uh, clinical trials did compare the radical mastectomy to the total mastectomy, which is a procedure that removes the entire breast tissue but without the full axillary lymph nodes under the arm. In this uh, NSABP BO4 study, breast cancer patients with clinically negative lymph nodes, meaning there were not palpable, uh, abnormally palpable lymph nodes, they were randomized to radical mastectomy, total mastectomy, and total mastectomy with radiation. And patients who already had positive lymph nodes, meaning they had abnormally palpable lymph nodes, they were randomized to radical mastectomy versus total mastectomy with radiation. The initial reports from this study, um, BO4 study, at three, five, and 10 years showed no significant differences in survival. And also longer term follow-up at 25 years, still there was no significant differences in, um, among these groups. So results from this trial confirmed that more radical surgery does not always lead to better results and radical mastectomy was no longer recommended to all breast cancer patients following um, publication of this trial. Next trials that came along compared mastectomy versus lumpectomy or breast conserving surgery. This trial was called NSAVP B06 trial that compared lumpectomy and mastectomy. And uh, all of these patients did go through a uh, full axillary lymph node dissection surgery. So patients were randomized to total mastectomy or lumpectomy or lumpectomy with the radiation. At 20 years of follow-up, there was no significant difference among the three treatment groups. And this trial also showed that the lumpectomy uh, with lymph, lymph node removal plus radiation is just as effective as mastectomy. And this is the trial where um, that allowed breast surgeons to offer the choice of breast conserving treatment 
uh, versus the mastectomy. Following these trials, um, the management of the axillary lymph nodes were also addressed um, um, during clinical trials. Just as a reminder, uh, sentinel lymph nodes are the first few lymph nodes to which cancer spreads. So when we do the sentinel lymph node biopsy and there's no uh, cancer cells found in these lymph nodes, it's highly unlikely that there's any cancer cells in the rest of the body. NSABPB32 trial, um, the purpose of this trial was to establish whether sentinel lymph node biopsy, removing just a few lymph nodes under the arm, can achieve the same therapeutic goals as the conventional axillary lymph node dissection. Um, but we know that sentinel lymph node biopsy, because only few lymph nodes are removed, there are definitely lower rates of lymphedema. Uh, so between May of 1999 and February 20, 2004, Patients with invasive breast cancer uh, who did not have any abnormally palpable lymph nodes, they were randomized to either sentinel lymph node biopsy plus axillary lymph node dissection or sentinel lymph node um, biopsy alone. Um, and only um, the, the patients in the sentinel lymph node biopsy group only underwent the full lymph node dissection if they were found to be positive. So at 10 years of follow-up, there was also no significant difference in over survival or um, disease-free survival, meaning uh, these patients didn't have recurrence of the, the cancer. And uh, following this trial, central lymph node biopsy was established as a good way to stage the axilla. And we also knew that it can also achieve the same therapeutic goals as the conventional full dissection. And there was definitely fewer patients um, having uh, suffering the lymphedema as a side effect. Now, decades later, um, there were also, although, you know, we were doing fewer axillary lymph node dissections, we were still routinely doing axillary lymph node dissection if the sentinel lymph node um, did have any amount of cancer cells. Um, and still, there are patients who still to this day um, do develop lymphedema. So there were... Um, was this other clinical trial, which um, looked at to see if there could be selective omission of uh, all axillary lymph node dissection in select patients. So this clinical trial uh, included patients who are 18 years or older, tumor size, smaller tumor size, but up to about five centimeters. And these patients did not have any abnormally palpable lymph nodes on physical exam. And when patients had the sentinel lymph node biopsy and were found to have one to two positive lymph nodes, uh, they were randomized to full axillary dissection or no further surgery. And all of these, the vast majority of these patients um, had planned radiation treatment and systemic therapy after the surgery. And about 10 years of follow-up, there has been no significant difference of um, local regional recurrence, overall survival, or disease-free survival. And um, following this um, practice changing clinical trial, um, it was noted that axillary lymph node dissection can safely be omitted in patients going for lumpectomy because this clinical trial only included the lumpectomy patients with planned systemic therapy and radiation treatment, even though one to two sentinel lymph nodes were found to be positive. And there have been, um, it would not be possible to go over all of the clinical trials that focus on de-escalating the treatment of the axillary lymph nodes. But even in setting of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, meaning some patients who need, need to go for systemic treatment like chemotherapy or other targeted therapy and are found to have positive lymph node at the time of diagnosis, um, if they have very good response to systemic therapy and if the lymph nodes become normal after the treatment, some patients are even able to spare, be spared the full axillary lymph node dissection. And we are doing um, sentinel lymph node biopsy and something called targeted dissection, meaning removing the previously positive lymph nodes. So a lot of other trials looking at um, not only the lumpectomy patients, but also mastectomy patients. For breast, I always tell my patients, breast cancer, unfortunately, is the most common cancer uh, in this country and uh, worldwide. But because of that, there are always ongoing clinical trials. And there are um, currently many, many trials um, to further de-escalate the surgical management of breast cancer. And there is uh, one trial that's even looking at eliminating 
potential breast surgery for certain, very specific certain types of breast cancer patients who have very good response to uh, new adjuvant systemic therapy. Lastly, I do want to mention there um, is something called Choosing Wisely Guidelines, uh, which pertain to breast cancer treatment. Uh, Choosing Wisely Guideline is a national campaign was, which was founded in 20, uh, 2012 by American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation to address some overtreatment. So there were many different professional surgical societies that have participated in the campaign. And specifically for breast, I did want to mention that in certain situations, um, we do not routinely use sentinel lymph node biopsy. If patients are found, not found to have normal lymph nodes on exam on N imaging, if they're over 70 years of age, 70 years or older, and if they have very early stage hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer, which is invasive, as um, endocrine therapy is routinely recommended to these patients, and the information from central lymph node biopsy may not necessarily change the treatment. And even though the rate of lymphedema is low, um, typically less than 5%, it is um, invasive procedure. So when there's no definite benefit from the information from central lymph node biopsy, we do sometimes omit the um, central lymph node biopsy in certain populations. Also, um, there have been consensus guidelines uh, in which um, currently, the recommendation is to not do routine reoperation in patients with invasive cancer. Even if the, the, the final margins are closed, but if there's no definite cancer cells right at the margin, um, some studies have shown that it is not always routinely necessary to do re-excise the margin to get to a very wide margin. To summarize, surgical management of breast cancer in 2024 has come a long way. And there have been um, many um, clinical trials that have been um, performed to address the de-escalation of surgical management. And currently, uh, whenever it is possible, we uh, as breast surgeons do discuss the option of breast conserving surgery when it's a feasible and oncologically safe option. Um, breast conserving surgery is less invasive surgery, smaller surgery than um, mastectomy, less time under general anesthesia, patients typically do recover faster. And also we always strive to do less invasive axillary surgery whenever it's feasible um, to reduce the goal, uh, risk of lymphedema. Lastly, so de-escalating therapy, um, what, does it, what does doing less mean in breast cancer treatment? Um, we have seen that through these clinical trials, there are equivalent, if equivalent long-term results as far as oncologic safety. And there can be less morbidity, better quality of life in survivorship. Now that we have much better therapeutic options, um, meaning much better medications, and our patients are um, living longer and having better quality, quality of life in general, I think it's even more important that we have these um, um, the escalation always in mind so our patients are able to um, enjoy better quality of life in their survivorship. In terms of lumpectomy or mastectomy has two sides. One has to do with um, patient factors and the other has to do with cancer factors. So if a person, if a patient has the option of both, it does come down to the patient's preference as to what they choose. Um, and usually that has to do with what they are willing to deal with with breast conservation. There's continued screening that's necessary, um, and there is um, radiation afterwards. If they choose to do a mastectomy, they don't usually have to do screening on that side, and often cases you don't need radiation. Um, if you don't have to necessarily do a mastectomy, there are some patients who choose it as a matter of preference, and some patients who will, most women will actually opt for mastectomy, uh, um, and it's the bigger procedure that we often, the more common procedure that we often do. I do not... I cannot really pinpoint how much cost we'll be saving by not doing axillary surgery. And that's never on our mind when we are talking about doing less versus doing more surgery. Uh, the reason to consider not do, doing axillary surgery again is number one is to before considering, let me put it this way, before considering not doing any surgery, we always have it in our mind that we don't want to undertreat any patient. 
So these kind of guidelines are there to help decide, make certain decisions. And we do have um, some patients where there is a very small tumor, very strongly hormone receptor positive, the chance of there being anything in the lymph node is extremely low to begin with. And we do know that in certain situations, the information will not make decision-making changes. That's the situation where we do um, consider not doing certain types of treatment. Now, does this apply to every single patient who's 70 years old? Uh, not necessarily, because again, I do think currently the whole population as a general is um, aging better, to put it one way. We do have some patients who are in incredibly good physical health, even well into their 70s, even up to their 80s. And the whole uh, rationale behind not doing excessive treatment or overtreatment does have something to do with longevity and life expectancy. So if we do have a patient who's 70 years old, but is in very good physical health and playing pickleball and doing very highly in, um, um, involved in several different activities, we, those are not the patients who we would necessarily say, oh, we just wouldn't do certain things only because you are 70 years old. So again, these are guidelines um, that can be, that should not be applied to every single person for the age group. There are nuances of treatment in certain situations. We do want to know the lymph node status to guide us certain um, types of you know, radiation field or other options. So it is being offered um, in very specific situations. And for coming personally for myself, the cost um, side of things should never be a factor. But yes, we don't practice like that, but we try to avoid we try to avoid procedures that in the end are not going to make a difference in someone's outcome, especially if it adds morbidity, right? Everyone has different number of lymph nodes under the arm. There are many in general. And doing sentinel lymph node biopsy, typically two to three lymph nodes are removed. Sometimes it's a few more. Sometimes patients, um, the technique we use reveals only one. But I would say on average anywhere between two to three. Anytime we do any procedure that removes a lymph node, there is a potential of developing lymphedema. But as the number goes down, the risk is definitely less. So um, can we put a number to which uh, a certain number where that lymphedema will definitely happen? We cannot because we do definitely have patients who've had over 20 lymph nodes removed and never developed lymphedema also. So on average, um, the literature does show uh, up to about 5% chance of lymphedema with sentinel lymph node biopsy. When we do a full axillary lymph node dissection, during which on average um, 10 to up to 20, sometimes even more lymph nodes are removed, the chance of developing lymphedema can be up to 20% or even higher. In patients who definitely require uh, radiation to the regional nodal areas, the risk can go up even higher to 30, even 40%. Dr. Weichman is an associate professor of surgery. She currently operates at Tisch in Long Island Hospital, sees patients at NYU Langone in ambulatory care in Garden City, Long Island. And um, let's welcome Dr. Weichman. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to talk about this, um, the reconstructive options. Um, I'm going to expand upon what sort of everyone else has talked about, but I have no disclosures. So breast reconstruction. This slide is, I like this photo because it basically shows that there are different sizes and shapes of breasts and not everyone has the same breast. Therefore, not everyone is a candidate for every operation. In general, when you're undergoing a mastectomy, there has traditionally been um, two main options, which is use breast implants. So that's placing breast implants under the skin and tissue, regardless of what type of mastectomy you have had. And that is, has been talked about before or using your own tissue. And traditionally that has been through um, what's from your tissue taken from your belly, which is traditionally a tram flap or a deep flap, if you may have heard of that, or tissue taking from your back, which is called a latissimus flap. Those are the traditional types of reconstruction. 
Um, however, we have, as plastic surgeons, with the help of and collaboration with our medical oncologists, our surgical oncologist colleagues, developed new surgical techniques um, uh, with the advent of nipple sparing mastectomy, with medical advances through chemotherapy, having patients live longer, and through post-treatment sequelae, so radiation issues and chemotherapy issues, we have innovated and we're doing more um, different types of reconstruction than just those traditional types. So what I'm going to talk about specifically are these newer techniques, which is nipple preservation when nipple reconstruct, when nipple sparing mastectomy isn't an option. Um, some alternative flaps. So not just using your tummy tissue. There's other places we can take tissue from to make breasts. Um, sometimes we have to use multiple procedures when uh, different indications happen. And then finally, I'm going to talk about oncoplastic procedures. And oncoplastic procedures, what that means is it's a use of the breast surgeon and the plastic surgeon to make the most aesthetic results. And we do that through sort of planning, incisions, and um, other techniques that I'll talk about later on. So uh, this is when nipple preservation when nipple sparing mastectomy is not possible. So I think we've seen in the photos that have been shown that um, maintaining a conical shape of a breast is very important. So a conical breast is a beautiful breast. Um, and here you can see that doing a regular skin sparing mastectomy removes the cone shape of the breast and the patient on the left hand side of the screen, it's the same patient, she has a nipple sparing mastectomy on one side and a skin sparing mastectomy with a nipple reconstruction on the other side. And you can see the flattening of the breast that makes it not look quite as beautiful from the lateral as the uh, nipple sparing. So preserving that nipple is very important. So nipple sparing mastectomy as highlighted um, on the top, this is a preoperative patient um, who underwent bilateral nipple sparing mastectomy and a two-stage tissue expander to implant reconstruction in front of the muscle. Um, the pre-op result is on the top and the post-op result is on the bottom. So you can see that as she maintains her nipple, she has a great shape and projection and with you barely can tell that she even had a surgery. So this is a result with nipple sparing mastectomy and implant reconstruction. But there are patients who are not candidates for nipple sparing mastectomy and these patients are highlighted here. So the patient all the way on the right, her breasts are both long, uh, large and also totic. So her nipple position is below the crease and therefore we cannot uh, save this nipple and offer her a reconstruction. Um, same, the middle patient, while her breasts are not quite as, as large, her nipples are pointing down and are not in a good position to offer reconstruction. And then again, the third patient similarly has large totic breasts that are fallen and not a candidate for nipple sparing mastectomy. So what can we do? Um, we can do something called an immediate mastopexy and, in, and with an implant reconstruction, or occasionally, if our breast surgeons say that this is feasible, use a free nipple graft in autologous reconstruction to help improve and save the nipple and improve this. So who are candidates for these two procedures? So not, again, not everyone that has large otic breasts that can't have a nipple sparing mastectomy is candidate for this. So we need young, healthy patients. We're uh, sort of more willing to push the envelope on prophylactic patients because they will not need adjuvant therapy. And therefore, if they have wound healing issues or anything like that, we're able to um, get not delay any of their adjuvant therapy. Um, Non-smokers, breast reconstruction is best done with a non-smoker. Uh, good skin quality and, as I said, approval from our surgical oncology friends. So this is what an immediate mastopexy and nipple sparing mastectomy looks like. So while the entire breast is removed, I want to highlight that is the most important thing. We want oncologically safe results, but we can keep the nipple alive on an inferior dermal, our skin pedicle, and are able to move it up and have it uh, survive and redrape the skin over so that you have um, a mastopexy and a nipple sparing mastectomy. This is an example of this patient. So she has had multiple procedures. So on her left breast, she had a tram flap and a nipple reconstruction, but on her right breast, uh, she had a nipple uh, 
she had a, a, mast a mastopexy and a nipple sparing mastectomy um, and an implant reconstruction on the right breast. So you can see we're able to preserve the nipple on the right side. The next choice is uh, free nipple grafting and immediate autologous reconstruction. So this patient, again, her, her nipples are uh, in the totic position, so we're not able to perform nipple sparing mastectomy, but we are able to do a free nipple graft, and this is, is just an early result on the table. So there are alternative flaps to using your belly. Your belly is the most common source, but some patients don't have abdominal excess tissue, prior abdominoplasty, prior liposuction, prior, or just not, that's not where they carry their extra tissue. So there are alternatives. This, so um, this is uh, patients, ha and as highlighted in that prior patient, if you had a prior a unilateral reconstruction with your own tissue, you're not a candidate for using it again. So, um, and a lot of patients desire to use their own tissue over implants. So the two main flaps that I'm going to talk about, next slide, are the profunda artery perforator flap and the lumbar artery perforator flap. So the profunda artery perforator flap or PAP flap is taken from the thighs. Now you can go to the next slide. Um, so here's a schematic of it that's borrowed from one of my colleagues. Um, so here you take the thigh skin and tissue and blood vessels and ho hook it up to blood vessels in the chest and use it for a breast reconstruction and the scar is hidden in the crease under your buttock. Uh, this is an example of a patient who had one side tram flap, one side pap flap. Um, so she had a tram, uh, sorry, a deep flap on the right side and then the left side she had uh, another cancer and we had to use her skin and tissue from her thighs for her left breast reconstruction. Here is an example of a patient who underwent bilateral um, nipple sparing mastectomy and bilateral pap flaps. The top is the pre-op, the bottom is the post-op. And then finally, the lumbar artery perforator flap. It's a newer flap where we take sort of the love handle tissue uh, with blood vessels and then a similarly uh, use blood vessels in the chest to take the skin and tissue and keep it alive. Um, we only usually do one side at a time for this because it involves a lot of position changes and time and it's, it's too long for anesthesia. So here is an example of a patient who has a poor implant reconstruction and had a prior abdominal plasty. So she underwent most recently the, the PAP, I mean, sorry, that lumbar artery perforator flap from her uh, left side going to her left breast, and you can see the improvement in the shape and contour of her both uh, waist as well as her breast. Often we need multiple types of reconstruction. So this is a patient who came to me who had prior tissue expander reconstructions and, and uh, radiation on her right side. With radiation, it's more challenging to do implant reconstructions, and she did not have a good result with these implants. So we were able to use her tummy uh, to create a breast on her right side and you do uh, a lift and a prepectoral implant reconstruction on the left side in order to give her a left breast reconstruction as well as a nipple reconstruction. And this is just the course of her care. So you just have to note that these things take many, many, many stages and sometimes can be arduous. And then finally, oncoplastic surgery. So as I talked about uh, earlier, this is a collaboration between the breast surgeons and ourself. And there are two main techniques. So there's volume displacement, where, which is the most common, which is using the tissue that is there and just reorganizing it to reconstruct the breast. And then finally, volume replacement, where we're taking tissue from another location and putting it into the breast for partial breast reconstruction in large lumpectomy defects. So this is just an algorithm that talks about it. The whole thing is a relationship of the breast size that the patient has to the size of the tumor and lumpectomy that they have. And, um, but the, as I said, the most common is doing volume displacement, which is in patients with larger breasts who already need a reduction. And this is an op opportune time to do um, and what's called an oncoplastic reduction where we reduce both sides um, and reduce the cancer breast to match. 
Um, important to note is there are different skin incisions for this. So uh, we plan this with our breast surgeon. So to, um, we can use a donut and periareolar incision, uh, a circumvertical incision, or a wise pattern incision. It all depends on what the needs of the patients are and where the tumor is located. This is just an example of an ideal patient for an oncoplastic reduction. The top is her pre-op, so she's very large totic breasts, lots of extra tissue, and she underwent an oncoplastic reduction and had uh, radiation to the right side and is and has a very good size symmetry and match for her body. Um, volume replacement is using regional flaps. So in patients that have larger lumpectomy defects and smaller breasts, we can sometimes use the tissue in the back um, based on some different blood vessels um, and rotate them into the defect. Um, different types are indicated for different locations of the tumor, um, but this does involve an additional scar that is um, not, that is involved on the back that is, that is uh, visible to the patients. So in conclusion, um, breast reconstruction is a evolving technique. We continue to improve the quality of life of patients and we work um, in collaboration with our referring surgeons. Um, we work to improve form and function of patients and really work to have patient-centered care. Thank you. Fabulous, okay. Uh, that's great, that's terrific. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of questions here. Thanks, Katie. Um, so, and again, you know, we we can all chime in here. Uh, this is uh, from one of the audience people. With a reduction lift following a lumpectomy, does the pedicle that is chosen, I think this is a plastic surgeon who wrote this, affect the cosmetic outcome? And what are the considerations uh, should be should be given to um, the the reconstructive um, options? So the pedicle that's chosen is completely based on where the tumor is. I think in general, most plastic surgeons prefer using a superior medial pedicle or an inferior pedicle for their, for their breast reductions. They're the most reliable. So either one of those is usually used, but it all depends on where the tumor is at, we, in relation to the, the tumor. So radiation greatly impacts our job. Um, so in general, radiation, we do not want to radiate like healthy tissue from the abdomen. So if you're going to use your own tissue, in general, we like to wait until after you've had that radiation uh, to use your own tissue in a second operation. So traditionally, it's something called delayed immediate reconstruction, where we put a temporary tissue expander in place. So you would have a breast there while you're getting the radiation and then we would wait about six months and then use your own tissue implants and radiation are very tricky so while we still do do implant reconstructions on patients that have radi need radiation they tend to have poor aesthetic results and also have um, sort of more complications so they may be more likely to go on to need a tissue a reconstruction with their own tissue because the radiation damages it doesn't it, it causes fibrosis in the tissue that makes it very hard to have a good aesthetic result um did i answer all of that i think you have right. one well, um in terms of the oncoplastic if you were going to do some volume replacement surgery um operating on a breast that has had radiation before so if you had um, a lumpectomy and radiation in the past, and then want to go on to have a breast reduction, it's a little more challenging. It is possible, but patients have higher rates of um, fat necrosis and wound healing problems that may need further treatment down the road. Can you just explain but, about fat necrosis for people who are not, like, don't know what that is? Sure. So fat necrosis is some of the tissue um, in the breast that is fatty tissue, not breast tissue, can become hard after the procedure and feel like a, a lump or a mass, which is obviously very frightening for patients that are undergoing breast cancer care. So it's something that we talk about and may require 
it's not a malignant process, but just feeling that it is a lump in you can be scary. So if we do notice that area of what we call fat necrosis, we often get imaging, which is an ultrasound or maybe even a mammogram to make sure that that is what it is. Um, and it can sometimes resolve on its own. Uh, and rarely do we need to go back and excise these areas, but it, it usually is just monitored. So uh, direct to implant is only in, in very select patients that have do not want to be larger. They have um, sort of small breasts and don't want to be larger and have, you know, good. Um, it's an interoperative decision that we make that that is a safe choice for them. So direct implant is really offered in only a sub a small subset of patients. But I will say that even if you do get direct to implant, about 60% of patients, the literature suggests that they need some sort of revision surgery, that while you do have your implant in at the time, that you may need a revision surgery. Um, do you want to do prefect retrofect, Oriana? Sure. So, um, you know, that similarly can be an intraoperative decision. Um, basically, the big difference is uh, when you put the implant under the muscle, um, or the tissue expander at the time of your initial mastectomy, you have a healthy layer of muscle above you, above your implant, protecting the implant. So in a very thin patient or a patient with a history of radiation or a smoker um, who hasn't quit smoking despite the recommendations where you're worried about wound healing and the potential problems that could arise, it's a safer bet to put it under the muscle. The downside is that you can get something called an animation deformity. And in an animation deformity, this means that anytime you're activating the pec muscle, whether it's you're lifting something heavy or moving something, the implant can shift up and down in position. Um, and this can be really bothersome, not only in appearance, but in the feeling to women. And so from this, um, the pendulum kind of swang towards prepectoral breast reconstruction, where the tissue expander and subsequently implant is placed above the muscle. But there are patients who aren't candidates for this and patients who have thin mastectomy flaps, meaning the skin and the fat of this tissue is very thin. You really do worry about having that prosthetic, that foreign body right under the skin, because if there's any delays in wound healing or any separation, you're looking right at the implant. And unfortunately, if you're looking at the implant, it needs to be removed and you need to restart the, the reconstructive process. So while a lot of young, active, healthy patients are really interested in prepectoral reconstruction, you just have to be cautioned about the potential complications because our literature does suggest that the complication rates are higher. So there's two main types of implants, implants that are saline filled, which is basically a saltwater filled implant that has a silicone shell or a silicone implant, which is a silicone gel that's inside a silicone um, shell. And of the silicone implants, there's then different varieties, um, which <clears throat> pertains to the cohesiveness or the thickness of the gel. So there is um, like a, a, um, a uh, highly cohesive gel that feels very firm and may be useful in patients who you're putting in a large projecting implant into who um, you want to try to avoid rippling or that look of seeing the implant surface um, ripple from the outside. And then there is lower cohesion, meaning that it is a softer, less filled uh, implant. And so this might be something that you use um, in a patient who's getting an augmentation that may have some tissue above the implant itself. Um, and then, you know, there's um, smooth surface implants and textured surface implants. Textured surface implants have been associated with a cancer called anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, we at NYU use smooth surface for this reason. Um, and, and so it's just something to know that if you had an implant that was placed many years ago, that's potentially a textured surface implant and you develop sudden swelling or any changes to see your plastic surgeon and make sure that there is no fluid collecting or any concern for anaplastic large cell lymphoma because in that case, you need to have the implant removed and all of the capsule, meaning the scar tissue that formed around the implant, removed um, to, to treat the, the potential disease. 
So Dr. Cohen is an assistant professor in the department of the Hans-Jörg Wies Department of Plastic Surgery. I think I said that right this time. She's trained in microsurgery with a practice focusing on breast reconstruction and microsurgery and lymphedema surgery and general plastic surgery. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm thrilled to be here and to provide a little bit of background and update on lymphedema and its management. So as we know, the function of the lymphatic system is threefold. It helps with fluid balance, transporting fats and fat-soluble vitamins into circulation, and defending against microorganisms and tumor cells. Lymphedema is characterized by an imbalance that can exist between the lymphatic load or what is being brought into the lymphatic system and its transport capacity, which is dependent on how many lymphatic channels you have and how functional they are. And unfortunately, lymphedema affects approximately 1 in 30 people worldwide. In the United States, over 10 million people suffer from lymphedema with approximately 200,000 new cases diagnosed annually. And the reported risk in patients receiving an axillary dissection, which we've discussed today, can vary in the literature, but can be oftentimes quoted at up to 20%. So in terms of diagnosis and staging, Patients presenting with lymphedema can present or complain of pain, heaviness, swelling of the extremity, or an inability to find proper fitting clothing, and in some patients, frequent infections. On clinical evaluation, patients oftentimes have increased tissue thickness in addition to the swelling, and then a decrease in pliability, meaning that there's some firmness and that the tissue or your skin doesn't pinch between the two fingers. Lymphocentigraphy is a study that we do, which has typically been the gold standard way to diagnose lymphedema at many centers. And technesium 99 is injected. It's a colloid substance that's injected into the web spaces or the spaces in between your fingers. And then your extremity is then scanned. And this substance is taken up by the lymphatic vessels. And so your lymphatics can be evaluated. And what we look for is the presence of dermal backflow, meaning that the lymph fluid, instead of traveling up to the armpit, is traveling backward and flowing into the forearm or upper arm. And that's diagnostic for lymphedema. Emerging as a newer gold standard in the management is something called endocyanine green lymphangiography. And this allows us to look at the real-time flow of lymphatics. So on the left-hand screen, you can see that uh, ICG has been injected into the spaces between the fingers. And you can see these nice linear or line-like channels, which is the ICG traveling up. On the other side, on the right side, you can see what's called dermal backflow or the ICG pooling in the forearm because there's been a disruption in the lymphatic flow. So when you see a patient in the office, the initial visit focuses on evaluating their lymphedema stage, the treatment goals, and determining what, if any, procedure is best for the patient. Most importantly, though, non-surgical or conservative measures are considered first line. And so what does conservative management look like? Complete decongestive therapy involves manual lymphatic drainage, <clears throat> daily compression, specific exercises, and care for the skin to make sure that you pr prophylax or prevent infection. If a reconstructive procedure is being um, contemplated, you have to ensure that a patient has undergone complete decongestive therapy for a minimum of six months prior. And importantly, patients oftentimes ask about diuretics, and diuretics don't have any role in the management of lymphedema and, in fact, can worsen the fibrosis that's associated with lymphedema. So surgery is indicated in patients that have persistent lymphedema despite conservative management, but is contraindicated in patients that have active infection that's not treated, an untreated or uncontrolled primary cancer or active recurrent cancer, and those who just aren't fit for surgery because of any medical comorbidities or medical conditions they may have. 
There are two main categories for lymphedema surgery, a debulking procedure and a physiologic procedure. <clears throat> so a debulking technique doesn't treat the underlying cause of the lymphedema, but it's aimed only at reducing the volume of the affected extremity, especially in patients that have a lot of fat deposition from the lymphedema. On the other hand, physiologic procedures such as lymphovenous anastomosis or LVA for short or vascularized node transfer are aimed at addressing the underlying disease process. So patients oftentimes ask about liposuction for debulking lymphedema, and it's less invasive than the, the um, historic Charles procedure, which involves removing a lot of the tissue and then putting skin back on as a skin graft, which is extremely debilitating. So this liposuction was first described in 1989 for treatment of lymphedema. And it can be effective in reducing the volume of the tissue, but it can damage the residual lymphatic vessels and therefore exacerbate lymphedema. Patients who have liposuction need to know that the underlying disease process isn't changing though. So you will have you know, progression of the lymphedema. You'll have to continue to wear compression and it doesn't necessarily treat um, the underlying cause or the progression of the lymphedema itself. So several published studies have confirmed that it can be helpful, though. Um, so uh, in addition to the in decreasing the incidence of infection, it can also have some long-term stability in patients who are committed to wearing lifelong compression. So having discussed this debulking procedure of liposuction, I'll now go on to kind of the physiologic procedures or the procedures that treat the underlying problem itself. And the two most popular are vascularized lymph node transfer and lymphatic ovenous anastomosis or bypass. Um, so vascularized lymph node transfer involves <clears throat> moving functional lymph nodes into the extremity. And this can be done in the anatomic location, meaning bring the lymph nodes to the areas they were removed from, which is orthotopic, or to another location, meaning heterotopic, in order to try to restore lymphatic function. And conversely, LVA involves uh, identifying an obstructed lymphatic vessel or a lymphatic channel that's not working anymore and targeting, targeting it into a neighboring vein or venule. So we'll first discuss vascularized lymph node transfer. So this involves the free tissue transfer of lymph nodes with their own blood vessels, meaning an artery in and an artery out so that these vessels can stay, these lymph nodes can stay alive. And it's been one of our more recent developments in the treatment of lymphedema, and it's to provide new function to these transferred lymph nodes in the affected um, extremity. And the presence of sig significant dermal backflow with few or functioning lymphatic vessels is an indication for this. Um, and we kind of look at the pattern of the dermal backflow to determine whether we should put these lymph nodes in the area where they were removed from or in an area where you're seeing the dermal backflow itself. And so there's many areas where we can take lymph nodes from. This can be from the groin, from above the clavicle, from under the chin. Um, typically, we don't like to take from the other armpit um, or from the omentum, which is an intra-abdominal or inside the abdomen lymph nodes. And it's important to know that if we're taking lymph nodes from an area that's critical in terms of draining, like the underarm or the groin that we have to reverse map to make sure we're not taking lymph nodes that will result in lymphedema of the area we're taking them from. And so people ask, well, how do these lymph nodes function? What do they, how do they work? And so there's two kind of proposed ways that they work. The first is by what's called lymphangio lymphangiogenesis or where these lymph nodes are creating new pathways for lymph to flow. And so this is mediated by factors that help with growing lymphatic channels from the transplanted nodes. And the second is a pumping mechanism where basically these new transplanted lymph nodes are pumping lymph fluid um, from because of pressure gradients that are established. 
And so the decision regarding where to put these lymph nodes is very individualized, taking into account what you see on imaging, what you see on physical exam, and what you have available to you. And so for the upper extremity, you can put these lymph nodes either at the wrist, the elbow, or in the axilla. And in preparation, you have to make sure that you widely excise any scar and scar tissue so that these lymph nodes can be functional and can go into a healthy bed um, and you don't want re scar tissue to reform. And so although vascularized node transfer is generally safe, there are complications. If there's a problem with the blood flow, you could lose the lymph nodes. You can get lymphedema where you remove the lymph nodes from. You can get fluid collections, infections, or have problems with wound healing. And although the you know, literature is still in early stages, the results have been favorable. And so this is one systematic review that was published in a surgical oncology journal, which reported a reduction in the volume by 47%, which is a very dramatic result, um, which you can see in the figure. And some case control and cohort studies also support the efficacy of transplanting lymph nodes in both reducing limb volume as well as preventing recurrent infections in patients. Um, and so this is for both patients who have lymph nodes that are transplanted into the areas that they're needed, as well as into areas where they were removed from. And we'll discuss the second treatment option, which is lymphatic ovenous anastomosis or LVA. So LVA was first described in 1962, and unlike vascularized node transfer, um, this procedure is indicated in early lymphedema and even prophylactic, meaning preventative indications. And the objective of LVA is to redirect the lymph to the venous system to bypass areas of obstruction. And so when it's going to be performed, the lymphatic system is assessed with that ICG um, and a laser. Um, so you can see the linear channels and then you select functional non-sclerotic or non-scarred lymphatic vessels in order to bypass them into the venous system. So here the lymphatic channels are all marked out. And once they've been, you kind of decide where you're gonna do your LVA, you make small little incisions on the forearm. <laughs> and you dissect, excuse me, the lymphatic channels, and then you connect them to small veins that are similar in size and in the vicinity. And so here you can see lymphatic channels being bypassed or connected to veins, and the configuration meaning end-to-end -end or head-on or end-to-side where the lymphatic comes straight in is dependent on the anatomy and what you find. And following the anastomosis, you can see that endocytium green is traveling through the bypass. So David Chang, who um, has a large experience in LVA, has um, shown his early experiences with it. And he did lymphovenous anastomosis in patients who had lymph <laughs> lymphedema for more than four years. And the mean volume difference between the affected and unaffected arm was 30%. And 19 patients, or 95% of these patients, reported improved symptoms after the LVA, as well as a reduction in <laughs> arm volume with a 29% reduction at one month, a 36% reduction at three months, 39% reduction at six months, and a 35% reduction at 12 months. Importantly, another contribution or application of this is called lymphosurgery or lymphatic microsurgical preventing healing approach. And so this is in patients where you know that they're going to have an axillary dissection and lymphatic vessels are dissected, preserved, and hooked up into neighboring veins at the time of axillary dissection in order to prevent subsequent lymphedema. And this is a really great application of the techniques. 
And so there's many uh, algorithms that have been proposed to, to determine what surgery is best for what patients. And so the evidence supports that LVA is typically better either prophylactically, meaning preventatively, or in early stage lymphedema, and that vascularized node transfer is better in advanced lymphedema, whereas debulking is better in patients that just have a lot of soft tissue excess who understand that the underlying dysfunction isn't going to be fixed. And so in conclusion, the existing data demonstrates that the surgical management of lymphedema is effective at alleviating the symptoms themselves, the risk of infection, and improving the function and appearance in patients that have lymphedema that doesn't improve with conservative management. And um, with more prospective studies and greater you know, integration of all of our imaging and our surgical techniques, hopefully our knowledge of the pathophysiology and the, our ability to treat the lymphedema improves. Absolutely, that's an ideal, um, an ideal indication for it. Patients who know they're going to have a lymph node dissection can plan to meet with a plastic surgeon and discuss LVA because the lymphatic vessels themselves can be um, tagged during the axillary dissection. Veins in the area can be dissected and preserved if LVA is going to be performed, and then that they can be connected at the time of the axillary dissection, even if radiation is going to be um, needed postoperatively, it's still indicated. And I would also like to thank the speakers before and now uh, to, to thank Drs. On. Uh, and Manasa and Weichmann and Cohen, uh, really uh, appreciate your time and um, your support of these community outreach events.